Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, it's uh, season two of Startup Talk. I'm JJ, uh, John Bradley Jackson, and I'm the director of the uh, Center for Entrepreneurship at Cal State Fullerton. I'm keenly aware that our audience is from uh, all over on internet radio. There could be 130 different countries uh, represented, so uh, I've got to be careful to not make any local references because who knows where Fullerton is, as an example, right? So uh, uh, Startup Talk is all about startups, and we bring in people from the community who've started companies, invested in companies, advise companies to kind of tell their story. The uh, Center for Entrepreneurship supports the uh, entrepreneur on campus as well as the community. And uh, we have two incubators uh, that are located uh, within driving distance of our campus where we uh, coach uh, early stage startups. Uh, I'm a professor in the classroom teaching entrepreneurship and the founder of Titan Angels, which is an early stage uh, investment fund. You'd call it a seed fund, I think, uh, uh, probably. Uh, you can find uh, uh, more about uh, me on johnbradleyjackson.com. Um, so why don't we jump right into it? I wanted to uh, introduce our guest today, Zandra Laskowski. Hi, Zandra. Hi, JJ. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So Zandra is a startup advisor. Uh, she is an angel investor. She's created her own fund. She's done a lot of things. And uh, we actually overlapped career-wise up in Silicon Valley. Uh, I was rooted in the semiconductor business many years ago. Yes. And uh, as I know you were. Yes, as, I was as, too. As well. But uh, so let's jump right into it. So today you're the uh, uh, general manager, acting direct, managing director of uh, OCEA Angel Investors. So tell me about that. Right. I'm founder and CEO of okay. OOC, which is like the sea that you swim in, OSEA, okay. Oh, okay. Angel oh, Investors. There's I a story it. behind that name, but yeah. <laughs> um, we, and we are a women's angel investment group based at uh, the UCI Cove in uh, Irvine, California. And we have, uh, we started the group in 2017. I started the group in 2017. And really the reason was because uh, I started angel investing in 2013. And I was looking for a women's angel investment group to, to join in Orange County. And I also had colleagues and friends that were very curious about what I was doing with my investments. And they also wanted to join a women's group. I looked around. It didn't exist. So I, I, I started it. <laughs> All right, very cool. And it was as simple as that? It just, there wasn't one? Is that well, yeah, you know, I had been um, a part of a few other groups here, which are wonderful groups. Uh, Private Capital Network, PCN, run by Doug Pennington, who is amazing. He's taught me so much. Um, I've had very, many friends and colleagues part of Tech Coast Angels, and they had been asking me to join and see what they're about. And I have, I, and I was going to those meetings, and they were great. But I really wanted to learn from women. I wanted to see what they were looking at and, and um, how they were doing, how they were putting their methodology to do their, uh, how they do their investments. And that group did not exist, which shocked me and surprised me in Orange County with all the wealth here. Uh, Orange County, California, being Southern California. So um, I started it. There was a need, and I thought it was scary at first because I didn't really know what an angel group looked like. So I did my research. I went onto Angel Capital Association's website, and there they have um, their members listed per state. I kind of looked at maybe 75 groups to see what the model looks like. They're all very similar but different. Some have funds. Some, uh, they, uh, they're individual investors that invest their dollars individually into each deal. Uh, some have membership fees, some don't. So I kind of put our, based our model on my findings. All right, very cool. Well, that's interesting to me because uh, a few years ago, I was involved in a study that was looking at how entrepreneurial Orange County was compared to the Bay Area and Route 128 and Austin, et cetera. And one of the things that popped out from the research was the large uh, number of angel investors that we have here in Southern California, Orange County, the lack of VCs. 
Uh, but as you go across the U.S., the angel investors are a little less pre uh, prevalent. You know, they're they're in different pockets, of course. Yes. So I would presume that uh, 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 OC investors then must be uh, uh, a uh, a leader then in 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 this, right? Yeah, I, you know, so I'm still I'm still shocked and surprised to find out that we are the only women angel investment group in Orange County and Los Angeles that connect women, our members, to the deals, that educate them on how to invest, mm -hmm. and that inspire them to keep coming back. There are, I know of many uh, venture capital funds and accelerators and incubators that are women-focused, women-facing, which are wonderful. We need to have those. But I was really, I'm still f shocked to find out that we are the only game in town right now. Um, I was at a, a venture capital event last week in Santa Monica, and I met some wonderful entrepreneurs and some wonderful angel investors. And these women reside in L.A. and uh, northern, northern, Cali nor northern Los Angeles, Calabasas, Hidden Hills, lots of wealth out there. And they just, they just loved to hear what we were doing with OC, and they asked, do we have a chapter in Los Angeles? I said, no, we don't. But I guess it's time for me to start a mobile membership, JJ. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, they were just, we want to come and see what you're doing. We hear you're doing it a little bit differently, but the same, the deals that you're looking at sing to us. So there's something here. All right. Awesome. Awesome. So who are your uh, investors? Well, first and foremost, they need to be SEC accredited. They have to be an SEC accredited investor, which means that they have the risk tolerance. They, um, they, they are able to invest at this level. Um, they have to be passionate about what we're doing. So when I ask would-be or potential members uh, to come check us out, I really mean that. I say, come to a meeting. Then you really get a flavor for what we do. I pack a lot of quality into two hours in that two-hour meeting mm -hmm. because, you know, we all – our time is precious. And if you're going to carve two hours out of your month to come and join us, I want that to be educational and inspirational. So they come and they walk away and usually they have this look on their eye like they're just blown away, like they didn't even understand what they just saw, but they want to learn more. Uh, that's the perfect – member. It's not so much I'm going to write a check immediately. I just, I'm intrigued by this asset class. Mm -hmm. It is considered an alternative asset. It's considered private equity. It's very high risk, but they get it. They see the deals. They see the deal structure. They understand the opportunity. And then that most likely turns into a membership. They want to come back and learn more. And how many uh, investors do you have today? We have, we started with eight in 2017 when I founded the group. And now we have 35. And we actually have two gentlemen that are members as well. Well, that was my next question. So uh, I know you've invited me to come attend, yes. and I, I would love to, but I was, uh, is it a club I could join? Of so. course you could <laughs> join, JJ. Yes, we have some wonderful uh, gentlemen that have joined us. And, you know, I, we do it a little differently. But um, as you know, I'm part of Titan Angels. I love what we do in Titan Angels. I love how you, you and Travis run the group. It is amazing. The deal flow is fantastic. I, I really enjoy the membership. I'm part of Tech Coast Angels, and I wish I could spend more time going to their screenings. I have so many, and, it, and it's been so wonderful. But um, I've really stepped back to run OC, to really focus on Orange, uh, OC Angels um, and build our membership and, and, and build our mission. And I'm also in the Cove Fund, which is a private venture capital fund based at the UCI Cove, but not affiliated with the UCI Cove. And the, the reason I like being a part of these all these groups is because, number one, I'm meeting fantastic people. I'm seeing amazing deal flow. And I'm actually... Um, kind of uh, uh, making, I have, I have uh, a, what do you call it, um, different types of deals in the different groups I'm in. So, for example, co-fund, the deals that they're funding, we probably won't look at in OC Angel Investors. And same thing with Titan Fund, although it's been interesting since I've joined the group, Titan Fund has seen a lot of value in the groups that we're bringing into or OC Angels and vice versa. We've been doing a lot of deal flow, and I, I, I think that's such a fantastic thing. Right, very cool. So um, what type of startup are you looking to invest in? Okay. Right, well, it's interesting. I, when I talk to our members, I, I, I say, you know, you should put together an investment thesis. And at first they're like, what does that mean? And it's really, 
through your experience, through the deals you're looking at, where are you comfortable investing? You know, where does the company have to hit the milestones and things they have to hit before you really do a deeper dive and possibly write a check for that mm -hmm. opportunity? And my investment thesis came about from my failures and my successes. Uh, so we look at a seven-point criteria that the, comp the startup has to meet before I take it to the next level and really do a deeper dive on what they're doing. Um, some, of those, I, some of those factors are they have to have a high barrier to entry, which means you know, there's, there's not a lot of other companies out there that are doing what they're doing. The competition isn't so prevalent. They have to have a differentiator. They, the founders should have built, scaled, and sold a company. If, and I know that, that's, that you don't see a lot of that, but when you do, that's important. If you don't, someone on the team, not the advisory board, not the board, someone on the team that's helping them run that company day to day has done that. It's very, very important to have that just because with my experience, if, if they're not communicating properly, if they're not coming to the investor base and their advisors when they're having challenges, it can be a problem. And sometimes it can be too late when they come to us. So. It's that fine mix. Um, they have to have a year of working capital in the bank to support the current burn rate. The, uh, there's been a lot of opportunities that have come to us, and you know they're honest with us on the burn, and they've got three or four months left of runway. That's a tough situation, a, a tough situation for a lot of startups. They've all been there. But for our group, because we're so new, and I'm teaching every one of our members how to do this, it's just too high risk if they don't have that. I got it. Uh, that means you say no a lot. Is that correct? You know, I don't like to say we say no a lot. I have 20 to 30 companies reach out to me a week, JJ. It's yeah, crazy. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to burst anyone's bubble because, frankly, they're my heroes. I don't have the guts to start a company. But I do have, I think, a good sense of something that could have a lot of legs and have a lot of possibility. Mm -hmm. So what I do is if, you know, again, most of the companies that come to me are not a fit for our group or any of the groups I'm affiliated with, but what I like to do is send them away with a, a feel good saying, you know, why don't you check out the Small Business Development Center? Why don't you go to back to your school, mm -hmm. your college, and your alumni, some of them have funds and incubators you can work with to kind of get that minimal viable product to the next level. Whether it's a startup, whether it's a small business, I try to send them, point them in a, in a direction. Yeah, I, I, I totally get it. And uh, as a part of the uh, uh, Titan Fund, the, the, the tough questions I think we ask uh, are our way of helping them because yes. they need to be able, the startups need to be able to answer those questions and to, in effect, build a, what they call a data file, right? All the information that they need for a potential investor to see. Right. And if they can't answer those questions, if they don't have the file, well, they're, they're not going to be ready uh, for, for us. And so, it, you know, I, I, uh, my, uh, my no <laughs> is no, not now. But if you can get this uh, questions answered, if you can get yourself ready, then let's come back and talk again. Yes, in our group we have, um, when we, in our monthly screenings, we have two companies pitched to us that have met the criteria. N by no means does it guarantee they're going to get funding. We are, and by the way, we're not a fund. We're just a, a, a group uh, where we introduce the deal to the member. Very similar to Tech Coast Angels. Um, they introduce the deal to the member, and then there's a due diligence process that goes on if there's interest. So um, when they come in, they pitch to us. We have two companies that meet the criteria, and I also ha offer one or two five-minute free pitch pitches to companies that aren't quite there yet. They're mm -hmm. still a little bit early, but they, they get to be a part of our group. They see how it's done by the companies that are already a little bit more established, and then I watch them. And I'd say we have about a 30% retention rate with some of those companies coming back to us in a year or so and pitching. Got it. Now, are there any uh, startup categories or verticals that you uh, prefer? You know, we're industry agnostic, but with that, was, with that said, um, We've been doing a lot of B, B2B, business to business, B2C, mm -hmm. and um, some consumer tech. So mm -hmm. those are the companies, those sectors that have been receiving funding so far. Um, our group uh, over the past, you know, we're going to our fourth year, have funded 11 companies, which has been really, really exciting. Um, so we're, 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 so there's something here. 
you know, we're finding there's a kind of a secret sauce and there's no lack of, fun, of really, really promising mm -hmm. startups out there I'm finding. Yeah, so I, I tell others that, you know, deal flow is not the problem. It's right. picking is the, the, yes, the challenge, I right? So let me, let me flip it. So what uh, might you avoid? What categories or opportunities? So not that they're not, there's not opportunities, but we don't look at pharma, we don't look at med tech. We just don't have the brain trust in our room. That's not the experience we have. And, and, and that's important because and I, I want to tell entrepreneurs that come to me and maybe aren't a fit for our group, I tell, I, ask, I tell them go out to the ACA, the Angel Capital Association, and do your homework on we, what those angel groups are investing in. Mm -hmm. some, some of them are very good about putting on their websites, you know, this is, this is what we like to look at. We like to look at oil and gas. We like to look at gaming. We like to look at healthcare. Each group has a little bit of a skill set, or more a big skill set, and that's their comfort level, and they're more inclined to fund those types of companies. So go out and do your homework and see what are those angel groups, uh, what, what's their expertise, and what are they funding? Yeah, speaking of homework, there's a term, <clears throat> it's kind of an insider term, uh, it's due diligence, and there's uh, pre and post mm -hmm. and all sorts of variations. <laughs> so can you describe the due diligence process that you guys use? Yes. So what we do, if we have five, if, if a company comes in screen, uh, pitches to us, and we have five or more of our members that are interested, we will do what's called a group due diligence. And um, there's a few factors that we look at. And we look at, uh, number one, one of the factors they have to meet is another angel group or known angel has already made an investment. That's very important because a lot of the heavy lifting has been done. So we can make, I can make a quick phone call to that angel or angel group, the, the due diligence lead from that group and say, okay, what do their financials look like? What do their p purchase orders look like? Depending on the nature of the company, you know, are they meeting their KPIs since you've invested? Um, so I can do a little bit of that background. And then what I do is I ask my members, what are things that weren't covered in the pitch? And I kind of give them a guideline, you know, ask for maybe some deeper background on the CEO, understanding where their customers are. Can you explain to us how you measure traction? That's very important. What does your customer conversion look like? And do you have churn? So there's a few different questions we will ask depending on, on what type of company it is. And then within a week or two, they will know if there's interest within our group. And if there is, our member will fund directly. You know, uh, in my reading, uh, as well as uh, my own uh, investing, I, uh, there's a kind of a amorphous attribute, which is called character. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, I, I don't know uh, what, uh, how important it is to your fund. Maybe you can talk about that and how you might assess character. Yes, of course, it's that, that gut instinct, right? That's what you're saying. You get this gut instinct with this founder. You get the gut instinct with, with the opportunity. That happens a lot. In my early days, I fell in love with everything I saw. I wanted to fund it all. I funded some things that, you know, my advisor said, wait a minute, you didn't, they didn't answer all these questions. Oh, I believe. I'm going to write a check. Mm -hmm. And that, that has a lot to do with it, that gut instinct when you're talking to the team. So that, that is important as well. You want to make sure that they are coachable. You want, to, you want to make sure that they are open to suggestions and that they will come to you if there's problems. So, yeah, the character of the founder and the founding team is very, very important. It's a relationship. You know, it's, it's kind of a friendship. You need to make sure, you know, I like, this, I like this person. I want to learn more. I like this person. I think I could go to school with them, so to speak. They could be my best friend. Not in that, that context, but you know, you know what I mean. So that's important, the, that gut instinct and the character of the founder. Yeah. So it's personal, and it reminds me of the uh, hiring decision that I would have made in my corporate career. And, um, you know, so let me give you a couple scenario. There's someone who uh, is a winner, has a history of winning, and it seems like a good bet. And then there's someone, you know what, they messed up. Uh, they've made a few mistakes, but maybe we should give them uh, a second chance, right? Yes. And both can be decent people. Uh, the, you know, uh, the money, well, you, you probably want to put it on the winner because the thinking is, oh, the winner is going to continue to win. The track record, yeah. yeah. But having hired uh, both of those people, there's no guarantee. There isn't. There <laughs> isn't. You kind of go with that, that gut instinct. At the end of the day, if everything's the same on paper except there's these few experiences with the with the companies or the people you're looking at, you're going to get, it's going to be a leap of faith. No matter what, with the startup investments, it, yeah. it's always a leap of faith. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've had uh, input that well, maybe there's a diagnostic tool 
like a dividing <laughs> rod <laughs> to no. find the to find the good people, you know. Then, uh, then yeah, many more many more angels would have many more successful exits if that was the case. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, let's let's flip it a bit. Uh, I, my uh, audience loves to hear uh, about the people, right? And uh, so let's go back. You know, where did you grow up? Sure. I was born in Whittier, California, which is a stone's throw away from here. Right. Um, and I went to high school in Hacienda Heights. I grew up in Hacienda Heights, okay. which is right over the hill from, <clears throat> from Whittier, and went to Wilson High School. From there, I went to Rio Hondo Community College. And unfortunately, I had to go back. I had to go to work. We, I had to earn money to, to pay my way through school and to just earn a living. So I had to leave college early on, two years in. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it, at first I was bummed about that, but I realized, you know, I need to make some money and I need to, you know, help with the living costs. And it was, it was, it was good, though. It's, you know, this, this idea of a gap year I think is really good because I was studying business. And at 18 years old, because I was told to, like, okay, study business, that's probably pretty general. I was sitting in marketing classes, business law classes. I was bored out of my mind. Economics, <laughs> bored. I'm like, how does this relate to me as an 18-year-old who's just trying to make a living and figure out who I am? I was bored. It was horrible. It was irrelevant to me. Today, if I sat in a business law class, I'd be licking it up. If I was in, e I, I study economics every day just to manage my own portfolio as well as understanding the trends for the angel investing. It's relevant. So it was kind of a blessing for me to be thrust into the working world. I started my career at, my grandmother got me the job. <laughs> she was banking at Security Pacific Bank, our local branch in Hacienda Heights, and I was doing some retail things. And she said, you know what, you need to work in banking. And I thought, well, I'm not really good with numbers, Grandma. Well, I don't care. I know the ma manager there. I'm going to get you a job. And she did. And I was a teller. And then I got to do something that was called post office. So I don't know if they, they have this anymore in, in the bank branches. But we actually had to uh, balance all of the cash coming into the four local post office offices that were around us. Mm -hmm. So I, I, myself and a colleague would sit in a blacked out room, like a, like a, a steel cased room within the branch. No one knew it was there. And we'd have Brinks trucks bringing us just loads and loads of money. And we, all we would do is just, is just count it, just verify oh. that it's, just, it's, we would count millions of dollars a day. And we would just sit back there with our boom docks and do that. And it was fascinating. And I used to think to myself, the post office really brings on in a lot of money. This is crazy. So, but anyway, so I started, I started my career there, uh, worked through the banking industry, loan processing, brought me to Orange County, um, and then I eventually found my way to Toshiba America. Toshiba was, is based in Irvine, and I, I believe there's still a small faction of this, of this, this branch I worked for still in Irvine. I think they're at, based at the UCI Cove. <laughs> um, I started in purchasing there and really learned a lot, was able to travel internationally to source vendors. So this vendors. is Toshiba America. Toshiba right? America, right. information <laughs> systems. They were manufacturing the laptops, the, the copiers, uh, yeah. PBX systems back in the late 80s, and really understood you know, how manufacturing works, how sales and marketing work, how do you sell a product? And through the purchasing experience, understanding how to negotiate contracts, just-in-time delivery, uh, tolerances, uh, making sure that the quality assurance tools that our vendor are, is using is the same as we're using here, you know, in Irvine. Learned a lot about just manufacturing and how to run a business on a very big scale. And then from there, I worked at many tech companies between Orange County and the Bay Area. So you ended up going to the Bay Area. I did end yeah. up going to the Bay Area with, with um, Toshiba. They decided to build their own disk drives to be their own source because that is how they did it in Japan. They would pr pretty much own their own um, um, hardware and software uh, vendor base. They, they basically mm -hmm. would own it, so they would have full control and they'd be you know, first priority. So they realized they needed disk drives for those laptops. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, they were the bellwether. That was, that was who everyone wanted to have was a, a Toshiba laptop. So I joined that team, which was plucked out of Silicon Valley. They, they were fresh off of, out of a, a startup called Connor Disk Drive. And they all went public, all became millionaires. So I went from a very uh, corporate, Japanese structured way of doing business to a startup, startup, <laughs> startup basically. And my boss at the time, Cindy Bunch, she's amazing. She taught me so much. One of my first really amazing mentors. She said, Zandra, no offense, but what you've learned at Toshiba to this point will not serve you in this disk drive division. And if you're willing to come over and work with us, you're going to have to learn everything from the ground floor up. And I was like a senior buyer at that point. And at first I was like, well, I don't know about that, but tell me more. I sat in with them for a week, 
let me tell you, my mind was blown. They would have what, what are called stand-up meetings. So instead of us, everyone, you know, come to a meeting at 10.15 and we're going to talk about this or that. And here's the agenda and we're all sitting around a table. Oh, no. They had a tiny little room, like about as big as this recording studio, with whiteboards all over it. And when you had, and they'd have like five or six meetings a day, but you were in there for one specific reason and one specific reason only. So you had the head of engineering, the head of manufacturing, the head of the guy building out the clean room, you'd have purchasing, you'd have sales, marketing, you'd have the heads in there. And they would talk about the next, what is the weakest link in the chain that's not making this happen for us to get to our goal? And it'd be bedlam. Be screaming at each other and cussing. But remember, these people came through the trenches together. They knew each other very well. I was hooked. <laughs> After those first two meetings, I was like, yes, Cindy, please accept my application and please train me to do this. This was beautiful. Different way of looking at things, different way of doing business. But the, the end result was still the same. Very cool. I got to disclose that uh, <laughs> I joined Condor Peripherals too late. Okay, so, yeah, so the before money, the IPO the money days. Been made, <laughs> and uh, I, I was the global account manager okay. for Apple. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so I was going to Dublin and all oh, in yeah. Singapore, and then Apple threw us out. Okay. And so. Who I, they I, go to Mac Store Seagate? What, or they start building I, around? I, 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 I forget <laughs> now. And so my my time with Connors was rather brief, but yeah, uh, yeah. but uh, the the culture was incredible and brutal at the same yes, time. So, yes, yes. <laughs> so I, I, I dig it. So um, so I think it's a so that, that takes you up through Silicon yeah, so, Valley and Silicon then you Valley. Up back down here, right? Then I I wound I wound up. So my husband. So I met my husband up in Silicon Valley. He designed chips for Lattice Semiconductor. I was a major account manager for Atmel. I was selling the same thing. Yeah. So we you know we actually had to sign NDAs because I was sleeping with the enemy, so yeah. to speak. But yeah. not really. But <laughs> but it was it was quite interesting because he came from engineering mentality yeah. and they hate marketing and sales pukes. Yeah. And I came from a sales mentality where engineering was just a pain in our right. butt. Right. You know. So it was just it was interesting. And still to this day, I mean, he, he hates sales and marketing. Yeah. But okay, that's another discussion for another day. So I met him up there, and we were doing really well in our careers. And mind you, this is the early 90s. There was no tech left in Orange County. So I was blessed to have been able to move up to Silicon Valley with Toshiba and continue my career up there, which was wonderful. Many opportunities for me as a major account. So I was in sales at that point, manager for a semiconductor company. And my husband saw, ran into one of his grad school professors at an industry event up there. The grad school professor flew him down here and said, I want you to work for our little startup. It's called Broadcom. And I had just come out, before I went to Atmel, I had just come out of a, 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 a disk drive company that blew up. It was a startup. It was the first removable disk drive, if you can believe it. And it, it just blew up, and I thought, no way. I like my cushy little job here with my salary and my bonuses and my stock options. I'm good. We're not doing startup again. Well, needless to say, he says I'm going. So we went for a couple hundred thousand dollars in, in salary and, and stock options to $40,000. And no job opportunities for me down in Orange County right, because right. there was no tech down here. So we took a leap of faith. We were fortunate in the fact that we had no debt. We had no children. We didn't really have anything keeping us up there except, you know, the great opportunities in our careers at the time. So it was a perfect time for us to take the leap of faith. So we moved down to Foothill Ranch, um, got the cheapest one-bedroom apartment we could find, living on $40,000. I mean, we had savings and yeah. stuff, but, you know, we're very conservative. So living on $40,000, maybe I can find a job as a hostess at a restaurant. I don't know. There was no tech down here. And um, eventually, I actually was the first, the only job I ever received in my career where I, I didn't know someone that walked in my resume. I was looking at an industry uh, uh, magazine, and I saw a phone number. They were hiring account managers, and the phone number had a Orange County uh, area code, 714. And anyway, it was Ingram Micro. I was a major account manager when I was at Atmel. They had major account managers doing almost the exact same thing. I was hired. It was wonderful. Met some great people there. Learned a lot about Ingram. I mean, they're still around, and they're huge. I believe they were acquired by a Chinese company, but they're the largest uh, uh, man, uh, reseller of hardware and software in the world. Yeah, no I, one has really heard of them. I but would I would have described them as a distributor. Is distributor. That the, is yeah, they're a distributor. To, right, yeah. They're a reseller. Yeah, well, distributor. They they distribute to the resale channels. Okay. Whether it's corporate resale or retail or right, retail right, resale. Right. right. You're right. You're correct. They're the largest distributor. So it was fascinating because my tech background, you know, it was perfect. It was just a perfect, you know, next path for me. And by the time I retired from there in 1998, I was managing the one of their largest accounts, which was $200 million at the time. It was a large reseller that we were supporting. And, and it was basically like running a small company. 
what our team had to do. Cost of doing business was huge. Uh, bringing on different lines of business, taking them away, discounts. It was fascinating. The cost of doing business was, f every time I woke up in the morning, first and foremost on my mind. So all of this experience, little did I know, really prepared me for the startup world. There you go. And so uh, coming back to the present, so uh, OC Angels is uh, your core, but uh, you also have... Uh, uh, another organization yes. called Zolas? Zolas, yes. Yeah. So I actually started with Zolas in 2016. And where that came about was before I started OC, I was seeing a lot of uh, a lot of startup companies. And I just realized they're really, or people that had ideas, they, they would come to me. They just really didn't know how to put it together. It's very overwhelming. And all the information and all that I, that I give to my clients, they can go find out on their own. I mean, it's out there. But they just don't know how to do it. They, they come from one specific skill set. And what I t so what I do in my advisory is I explain to them, this is what, if you're going to go for angel, venture capital, or family office money, this is what we're going to be looking for all the time in your story, in your pitch. And, and I back it up even there. If, if, it's a, if it's a startup kind of idea they have, that's one avenue to go. If it's a small business, completely different. So my clients can have startup ideas or they can have small business ideas. I can help them nonetheless because the, the basic building blocks of putting a company together are the same at that level. When I see that they possibly have something that might be a fit for angel or venture capital down the road, that's a different path they take. So that's what I help my clients do. Figure out number one is their idea is there a market here for this? And if not, let's go do some more research. This is where you do research. If there is, here are the next steps to go after Angel. This is what we're going to be asking for in due diligence. This is what we're going to be looking for in your pitch deck. Um, these are things you need to be thinking about in your research because we're going to grill you. And I always recommend if they haven't done so or if they're in that early stage, go find an incubator or accelerator. Because we can really see a difference in the pitch deck and just the formation and where they're at with their metrics in a startup that's, that's come through an accelerator, that's come through an incub incubator, and had that mentorship versus one that hasn't. There's a difference. It, yeah, so you, you hit on something that was really interesting because uh, as an investor, you're looking for the highly scalable uh, businesses. But most businesses are not highly scalable. Correct. And in fact, most uh, might provide a good uh, income. They might be a family business uh, or a, a, another business that would be low growth. Well, that's not interesting as to an investor, but they're still very viable businesses. Right? Oh yeah, they're 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 really I see them all the time, and and again, you know, there's there's many different ways to success. I mean, and what and you have to back up and define, you know, what is success to myself? A young person, they're just figuring that out. As we've lived a few <laughs> decades, you know, we're we're really fine tuning, like you know, what's what is pretty basic. This good, things that are going to make me ha happy, and so with those founders, you know, the small business owners, it's freedom. You know, it's freedom to come and go, uh, do, you know, uh, mentor other people, maybe expand your business. For the startup entrepreneur, it's that big dream. You know, it's that big dream about, you know, I want to build this. I'm bringing something to market that's solving a problem. And those are the best ones. I mean, if you have to agree that, that those founders that are really passionate about the mission, about the problem they are solving. Um, that's exciting. And, and if it's scalable, and as you know, not all of them succeed, but when they do, it's just so exciting to see that, to hopefully be on the ride with them. They exit. They're giving back to their community in different ways. Everyone that's been on that ride benefits. Everyone's come out with, you know, uh, you know a great experience, and hopefully they move that forward and create more businesses. Interesting. So uh, back to OC Angels mm -hmm. then. Um, at what point in time should they reach out to the angel investor, how, uh, where in the path? Uh. I, I, you know, it depends on who you're talking to. Again, do your do your research. I know venture capital and angel groups that look at very early stage, pre-seed. There, there's more of those popping up because they just want to be there at the ground floor. I'd say the majority of the angel groups I'm affiliated with, you have to have your MVP, your minimal viable product, has to already be in place. You have to be in pre-revenue, if not revenue. You have to have a go-to market strategy in place that you can explain. You need to have somewhat a grip of your cost of customer acquisition. There's And depending on what you're doing, there's many factors that go into that cost, and, and you have to be good at, at figuring that out. Um, you have to be able to explain the problem you're solving and why anyone would want this. 
You know, the total addressable market, I don't, you know, if, if it's it definitely has to be sizable, it can't be like you know, $10 million, but it doesn't have to be billions and billions. There's some great startups out there that, you know, have a billion dollar market, a couple billion dollars. That's great. If you can take a piece of that and it's meaningful, that's compelling to us. So really do your research on the problem, research on your competition, understand the total addressable market. You have to have a minimal viable product. Um, you know, a go-to market strategy in place. You know, we know that that can change as uh, as you're scaling. But those basic things should be in place before you start pitching. Yeah, I, uh, I'm going to describe a situation. So I had a friend that was at Kleiner Perkins, which is a premier yes. VC firm, and he relayed that in a given year they received twelve thousand business plans. It's and, a lot. Uh, so a, a number of investment uh, organizations allow you to submit electronically. And uh, yet, uh, they're only investing in Kleiner Perkins like 25 deals a year. Right. And uh, so my immediate reaction is that that's the last thing you want to do. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> because it's so competitive, but you want to get to know the investors, whether they're venture capitalists or angels, early and develop a conversation and yes. awareness uh, and then let them pull you in. Right, right. Would you agree? Yeah, so. I, I definitely agree with that. Um, and you're going to learn a lot because uh, so some of the earlier uh, companies I invested in didn't make it. And there's definitely, uh, and, and, and that's okay because they're not all going to make it. There's definitely a great way to fail and a bad way to fail. And, I, and I, I'm going to have to write a book on this, JJ, because it's, it's true. It's true. I'll help you. Um, yeah. So, but, you know, those those that failed well, uh, let's put it that way, they kept us informed. I was on the board most of the time, most of those companies. We saw it coming. It wasn't like, oh, one day we're, we're out of money. We saw it coming because the team kept us informed. They said, you know, we're having some hiccups here. We're having some pivots. We're, they're talking to the board. We're trying everything you know, to, to, to fix it. Some of these companies lasted a year. Some of them lasted six months. But at least they communicated with us, and we were all aware of what was happening. So, you know, and we know as angel investors, everything's high risk. It has to be money you can burn in a trash can. It has to really be disposable money. So, um, but going back to your original question about the entrepreneurs, staying in touch with the angel groups, you know, trying to pick someone's brain, going to the events that, 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 that all the schools here in Orange County offer, that's going to be valuable. You never know who's going to be in that room. And, you, and I'm learning all the time. I, I, I'm going to be learning till I'm dead. I mean, I just, every day I learn something new. When it, if it comes to startups, if it comes to sectors in the startups, if it comes to what, how we're doing due diligence, what people are looking at. And that's the way you should be looking at it, too. Try to go to one or two or three startup networking events, something that's in that ecosystem a month. They're, most of them are free. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know what's going to inspire you from that movie. I'm mean, from that movie, from that meeting. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a movie. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, let me, let me, let me just interject there. So before I, I write a check for anything, uh -huh. I watch something ventured. And that Kleiner Perkins is featured in there. Okay. And it's a documentary on Netflix. I think it's on every, <clears throat> and, on, on every streaming service. And it's about the founding of Venture Capital. And the, the, the first venture capitalists and what they invested in. And they're doing the same things that they're doing today. It's just really a leap checks. of faith. Just be, bigger checks. <laughs> More zeros. Yeah. Or small checks. I mean, yeah. one of the gentlemen, he invested $50,000 in Apple. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, okay, here's $50,000, yeah. and he's you know, he's a venture capitalist. But it's it's a great movie to watch for anyone, really, because it kind of gives gets in the mind of an entrepreneur, gives you a, the, the, the mind of a venture capitalist. And I hope they do uh, something ventured 2.0, because it, the landscape has changed completely since they filmed that. And it's, it's quite interesting out there, and there's, a, you know, there's, just, there's a lot of opportunity at every level. It doesn't have to be a billion-dollar exit. Right. So it's interesting uh, uh, about the role of the investor, and you know, you and many times you're uh, on the board, uh, and you're mentoring. Uh, uh, tell me about uh, mentoring startups. Uh, what that's like? Yeah. So um, one thing that's that's very important is keeping the goals, in, you know, keep them keep them simple and streamlined. It's easy to get into the weeds, and. Um, keeping those metrics in place and communicating. So one thing is, let's keep the goals. You know, we can't go after every vertical, depending on where they're at. We just have to, let's go to the one that's a low-hanging fruit. Let's keep the goals simple so the whole team knows, which is usually a small team, and the investors know what you're going after, what your steps are to do that. 
Communication is key, and it doesn't have to be you know a 20-page dossier. We don't want to see that. No one wants to see that. Keep it to a one-pager. Uh, if you want to do it monthly, great. Not necessary. Quarterly is important unless you're ha you're hitting problems. If you're having problems, you need to reach out to everybody immediately. We understand. We'd rather have you reach out to us because you don't know who we know that could possibly help this log jam, could possibly make an introduction. So communication is key and keeping it simple. Um, and then, you know, just keeping, keeping abreast of what the competition is doing. How can we do it differently? So depending on the company, the mentorship is a little bit different, but it's typically the same. Let's look at that burn rate. Let's keep it simple. And uh, I think uh, full disclosure, honesty, uh, and, and that's hard, uh, I think, when you're a startup founder, when things aren't going well. Yes, yes. To basically say, I, I need to... I, they I need they to see it as an embarrassment. Yeah. They see it as they're letting <clears throat> you down. So if you have those discussions early on when you're writing the check and, and as, after you've written the check saying, hey, I don't care if it's something you think you just really messed up in and you need help with, you need to reach out to us because it's on our, all of our best interest that we face this thing head on, and we come up with a solution really quickly. We will not see this as a weakness at all. In fact, we'll see it as a strength that, hey, I need some help. We, we want that. We love that. So communicating that in, in, you know, in, the, in the best way you can with that founder, that's important. And if they're listening, yeah. you can communicate that. And yeah. if they don't listen and they don't yeah. do it, that's another problem. Uh, Touche. I, I think uh, one thing an investor doesn't like is surprises. Yes. And it's like, uh, it's the, the email that says, well, if we don't get X amount of cash in the next uh, two hours, yeah. <laughs> we're in Oops. trouble. Well, there's one I invested in. I'm not going to name the name, but she's doing a great job. She's had a lot of pivots in the right direction. She's kept us abreast of it. We've seen this, this ship turning for the past eight months. She's already been preparing us and how she's going after it and what she's doing to preserve the capital, making it easy. That's why the, the pivot's taken about eight months, but we get where she's going. We're behind it 100%. She's thoughtful. She has to get rid of a little bit of luggage over here. She's streamlining over there, but it's happening. So she, it's a rock star. And hopefully when I come back in a year or two on this show, I can talk about that success. Cool, but cool. she's been very good. It's not always perfect. We don't expect it to be picture perfect. I mean, that's wonderful, yeah. but it yeah. rarely is that way. You can start out with this is our mission. This is the, com this, the customer we're going to serve. But then in six or seven months, you're going to have to pivot to another direction for whatever reason. That's okay. We're used to it. We know it. If that's going to help propel the success of the company and the vision, let's do it. Very cool. So continuing on mentoring, uh, do you have mentors today? Can you tell me about them? You don't have to name names, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I have um, wonderful mentors. They run, some run their own venture capital fund. Some um, are angel investors. Some have exited and they're not angel investing anymore. I love talking to, any, as you know, JJ, I'll talk to anybody. <laughs> I like to learn their stories because it's, it's, it gives me an insight to what they're doing. And I always ask for advice. And I always ask, you know, what are you doing right now? What are you working on? What does that look like? Um, so, the, and they're all walks of life. They don't have to be a seasoned veteran. I had, I met a wonderful young gentleman, Nick Diorzio. He runs, he, he works for InVen Global, which is a, a e-sports uh, media outlet in, based in Irvine. And I know that esports is something our group wants to look at. We want to understand, you know, this is a burgeoning sector, but we have no clue what it is. So I met with him. He's a lovely young young man. Or I shouldn't say young man, but to me he is. Knows so much. He came and spoke to our group last month, and it just blew our minds. He put it so succinctly what the opportunity is. Because when I think of e-gaming, I'm not, I'm not an e-gamer. You know, most of the kids on this campus probably are, or at some level, do it. They participate in Minecraft or Overwatch or Fortnite, but not even participate. They watch teams participating in, at a contest level. This is a huge opportunity for us. So he's a mentor to me. I, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, we're going to have lunch later this week. I'm going to just pick his brain some more to say, this is fascinating. What are the verticals here? What are the opportunities here? I spoke at, as an, on the investor panel at one of their summits, and there's agents out there that are repping these 13, 14, 15-year-old kids that are gamers, that are making tens of thousands of dollars in purse money. This is a new industry. So that's a mentor. I'm going to have mentors for the rest of my life, depending on my, what my interest is. So... It's, it's, you know, I, I reach out to them. I'm shameless. <laughs> I see them. I, do you, and I reach out to my network. Do you know someone that knows e-gaming? Do you know someone that knows about healthcare SaaS tools? Because that's huge. Um, I, I just, I love that. So I'm, I'm finding mentors every day. All right. Very cool. 
I, I feel exactly the same way. Uh, so as much as uh, I'm called upon to mentor others, I, uh, I, I know that I need help too. Right, yes. <laughs> and guidance, and yes. I need, I need a, a sounding board. So given where you're at uh, today, how do you measure your uh, success? Yes. Well, when it comes to um, Zolos, uh, typically I only have to spend an hour or two with my clients. And they walk away with so much information. They're so thankful because they, they usually save a lot of money because they're going down that path of getting friends and family or t getting a loan. Um, so that's how I measure it is, is that they come back and they just say, that was that was the most incredible hour or two I spent with you because you just put me on the right path. You, you, you put it succinctly to me. Um, and then for OC, it really is, the purpose of OC Angels is to educate more women about this alternative investment asset class. And when they come to our meetings, they love it. And we give them the thoughtful education. Besides the connection to the deals, how do you vet a deal? How do you do your due diligence? We offer that to them in a very um, bite-sized, not not you know uh, intimidating way and then we keep bringing the inspiration whether it's a speaker about a sector that's burgeoning mm -hmm. this month our speaker is going to be about boards board member being a board member because many of our members after, after they mm -hmm. invest or they're just captains and, and princesses and queens of industry mm -hmm. um, they're asked to be on boards and the state of California put a, a new law in place saying every company based here has to have one female female board member and I've been a board member um, and it's not as simple Tell as you think. Tell me about that law. Yeah, that, I don't know exactly what it's called, but it went into place January 1st. And that's for C-Corps, I'm not exactly okay, sure, but yeah. they, I, I believe it's, and don't quote me, it's, yeah. it's California-based companies. I'm not sure. They have to be a certain size. Right. Um, uh, so that's, that's wonderful. That's a step in the right direction for sure. But as a board member, there's a lot of responsibilities there, legalities you need to be aware of. So we have one of our members is on the board of First Foundation Bank. And she's a rock star. She's she's amazing. So I asked her. I said, "Could you come talk to us about there's being a board on a nonprofit, being a board on a, a board member on a startup, being a board member on a private company and public companies?" So you have to really look at each one. They're all a little bit different. So she's going to come speak to us and give us just a basic overview wow. of what it is to be a board member. Um, so so back to measuring the success for me, it's really simple. When they leave a meeting and they and they send me emails and they're just blown away. Bring on, bring it, bring in more. That's the success. If I have one woman or man that wants to learn about angel investing, we exist. Very cool. So uh, it's a year from now, uh, and we get together. Uh, what are you going to tell me? We'll probably have started our mobile membership <laughs> because we have. Um, Women in the Bay Area and Los Angeles and San Diego that want to join so our group. So it'd be a, a virtual? Yeah, it'd be a mobile uh, membership. Okay. I'm trying to wrap my mind around how that will work. Uh, but it's going to happen. I mean, I just, I, yeah, it's it, that. Well, so we'll have, hopefully have launched our mobile membership. Um, hopefully have, uh, you know, invested. For me, it's not, it's not quantity, it's quality. We've had a few more new, of our newer investors investing um, in some deals this year. And uh, building that membership, you know, slowly and sure, you know, slowly and surely. Um, and it's, again, it's not about the the quantity; it's about the quality of the person in the room. I totally get it. So, uh, you know, I, I asked you a couple of weeks ago to come join uh, me today. Are are there any questions I didn't ask you that you thought I might? you would like to talk about now? You know, <laughs> that, that, sometimes that's a hard one. But. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. So there's just one, there's one thing I'm, I'm seeing in the venture capital angel world is a lot, and a lot of the larger venture capital groups, and there's a lot of private ones, you know, they have funds anywhere from 100 billion to a billion, are now looking at the angel level for investment. And that's a smaller fund. They're starting new funds with smaller dollars, maybe $50 million. Yeah. And they're going to seed maybe 100000 And so they've come to me for advisory because they don't know how to do due diligence at the angel level. It's a different animal. And so uh, they've come to me for some advice and how you do it and how do you do it in your group. And it's fascinating. And I'm like, well, why are you wasting your time at the, the, this, at this level? You're writing such big checks for your investors. Well, they said they understand it's, it's going to be you know, high risk longer incubation than what we already have in the other private equity funds, but they want to go where the future is. They want to go start at the ground floor. And we understand. I said, you know, $100,000 check is probably pretty good for any of these startups that are raising, you know, anywhere from a million to five million. 
And they said, no, we understand that. We're going to write smarter, smaller checks and be on the ride, and maybe we can, then we want to participate in the Series A. If it has legs and it's, it's scaling and building, we're already there at the ground floor, hopefully giving some guidance and some support, and then we're going to get into the Series A and we can put more dollars in. So that's a very interesting trend I've been seeing, you know, for late, mid to late 2019. Very cool. Well, you've been most generous with your time. What can uh, we do for you, our listeners? Uh, uh, oh, keep dreaming. Keep, cre- keep creating. You know, there's, there's, there's a couple books I want you to read. One's called The $100 Startup. I don't know if you've read it. It's a no. small book because I know everyone's busy studying and stuff. Um, it's a small book, and you can just you could just pick a chapter and read one. It's very inspirational. It's about people that, you know, through they're not a choice of their own, had to go and start their own business, and they're doing very well, and they have freedom in their life, and they have money to live their life and in the ways that they want to. And then the other book is called The Fundable Startup by Fred Haney. Um, it's looking into, and that's written for the entrepreneur. He's 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 a venture capitalist. He's going to tell you what we're looking for in your company and due diligence and the pitch deck, everything you need to know. It's a great primer. Very cool. And if our listeners wanted to reach out to you, what, how would they do that? They can email me at Zandra, which is X A N D R A, which is Sandra like an X with an X. Zandra at O C Angel Investors dot com. That's O S E A. Angel Investors with an S dot com. Very cool. So um, I wanted our listeners to know that there's an event coming up that uh, y'all should consider attending. Uh, it is on Leap Year Day, February 29th, mm-hmm. and it is a celebration of entrepreneurship specific to Orange County. And it's a event that uh, will be at Cal State Fullerton. But we are collaborating with Applied Innovation oh, at UCI. Oh, yes, I heard about this. Uh, this would be great. Yeah, Concordia and, and actually Chapman. That's great. And we've gathered together about 30 individuals who are going to tell stories. They're not going to do PowerPoints, <laughs> but they're going to talk about starting a company, growing a company, exiting a company, uh, success, maybe not so much success, and, and sharing in that event. So uh, if you go to Eventbrite and say CSUF uh, Entrepreneurship, that event will pop up. It's free. It's on a Saturday afternoon from 1 to 5. Would love to see you there. And uh, thank you all for joining me. I uh, encourage you to, in, to visit uh, the Fullerton website, uh, www.fullerton.edu, or my website, which is johnbradleyjackson.com. Look forward to uh, talking with you soon.